It's my pleasure to introduce our next and final speaker for the morning session, uh, Tom Reed. Tom is the West Coast Conservation Land Manager with Nature Trust of BC. And Tom is a longtime Vancouver Island resident and is passionate about estuary and marine environments. He sees estuaries as the heartbeat of aquatic ecosystems among rivers, ocean and upland environments. In his work with Nature Trust, he aims to link science and restoration work with the opportunity to build meaningful partnerships with community groups and coastal First Nations communities. Keeping Tom especially busy these days is his work as project manager for the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund's five-year project to assess the resilience of 15 estuaries on Vancouver Island, Central Coast and Haida Gwaii, and to implement several restoration projects. And I'll pass the mic over to Tom now to hear about this important work. Great. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate the uh, introduction and for um, being invited to participate in this uh, knowledge exchange workshop. And as Jason said, I'm, uh, I'm the West Coast Conservation Land Manager for the Nature Trust of BC, and I also work in uh, partnership and coordinating uh, a land management program with Ducks Unlimited Canada, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, Environment Canada, DFO, and the province. And so today, what I'm going to speak about is um, how we've utilized um, a multi-metric monitoring tool to help inform restoration and conservation actions uh, throughout the coast of BC, uh, focused on these uh, near shore estuarine environments. And as I go through, what I was thinking is I just want to set the stage as to why it's really important for us to implement these um, tools to help inform management and restoration. So with that, I just want to provide a little bit of uh, the scope or the background of the importance of these uh, sites in um, British Columbia. So I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, but uh, estuaries and coastal wetlands provide comprise less than 3% of BC's coast, yet they support over 80% of BC's coastal fish and wildlife and provide critical rearing and staging habitat for Pacific salmon. But in addition to that, migratory birds on the Pacific Flyway, juvenile crabs, shellfish, plants, and a, and a whole myriad of species. And they're incredibly rich ecosystems where the marine uh, nutrients from the marine environment meet nutrients from upland watershed and just creates this hugely uh, productive area. Economically, uh, in the coast of BC and in the Pacific Northwest, 75% of all commercially and culturally important seafood rely on estuaries, including salmon, clams, clams oysters, crabs, and forage fish, as we've uh, heard from with uh, the previous talks. And one thing that's also really important is a recognition of the substantial food uh, productivity of these areas. And there's been some recent work come out of the uh, Western United States about uh, looking at food production and productivity. And uh, it, it was concluded that one acre of estuary habitat produces um, more food than one acre of cultivated agricultural land. And, and I think that's a really important thing um, to keep mindful of with restoration is that we're also not looking at just restoration for fish and wildlife habitat. It's also restoration or management enhancement for uh, continuing different uh, culturally significant food systems and providing um, this this resource moving forward. So, and they also, as many of us know, provide essential climate services uh, such as pollutant sediment filtration, uh, flood water absorption, storm surge mitigation, and climate change moderation. Uh, they're powerful carbon sinks, sinks with sediments capable of capturing carbon 10 times as quickly as forest sediments. And so this is also emphasizes the importance of these areas and, and being mindful of that first statistic I mentioned that only uh, less than 3% of the coast um, is made up of these ecosystems. It just underscores the importance of them. So one of the things that we've worked on uh, in this partnership program I work is to work to identify and map all the estuaries in BC. And so um, I think that shows up there. Yeah. Uh, so over the years, these partners in the Pacific Bird Habitat Joint Venture, which includes the Nature Trust uh, and uh, Environment Canada, CWS, uh, and other partners have worked to identify all the estuaries on the coast. And this map shows the locations um, of these sites. And what they've done is they've looked at the importance classes from a class one to five, class one most important, five least important, but really all of them are critically important. And class ones are like the Fraser River and the Skeena, uh, and there's a few on Vancouver Island as well. In terms of 
from the Nature Trust and our other partners. So recognizing the importance and significance of these sites, there's been a lot of conservation initiatives over the years and to date in the coastal area of uh, west coast of BC, um, there's about 110 sites for just over 11,000 hectares that have been uh, designated through different uh, designations, whether it be conservation areas, wildlife management areas, or fee simple acquisitions. And many of these sites uh, come into the program uh, that I manage to do stewardship and management activities on. And this just provides um, kind of a, not the greatest detail because it's such a large area, but there's a lot of the sites. So you can see there's not that many sites that are under a designation, but I know there's more potentially coming through different initiatives through Indigenous and First Nation partners through IPCA work. So one of the challenges we have with these really abundant, low-lying, near-shore ecosystems of estuaries where rivers meet the ocean is that they're very popular for developments and urban settle settlements um, and change over time. There's some statistics from the Fraser that shows a 70% loss of the original wetlands in the Fraser, uh, the Fraser Delta, uh, especially, and then 60% of the estuary and marsh habitat in the Salish Sea has been impacted um, by development and just under 50% of those 430 estuaries that I identified earlier are threatened by coastal development, modification and pollution. And this is underscored and coupled with the fact that with climate change, we're gonna be starting to see significant impacts to these estuary ecosystems through a number of mechanisms such as rising sea levels, oceans, acidification, temperature, salinity uh, changes and uh, changes of freshwater and sediment inputs. And so one of the challenges that we have as, you know, how do we monitor and make sure we're using the best uh, use of resources is it's been a challenge. I think a lot of organizations are challenged. So how do we uh, make sure that the limited resources and capacity we have are being utilized effectively and efficiently to ensure these uh, important ecosystems um, are resilient over time? And a few years ago, I was very fortunate to meet with some um, research directors from the National Estuary Research Reserve uh, Network in uh, the United States um, through the through NOAA. And they had been working on uh, trying to figure out a system or a tool to uh, implement a multi-metric tool that could assess the resilient of, resilience of these ecosystems to sea level rise and some of these changes, uh, climatic changes or ecosystem drivers of change such as sediment supply and whether or not they'll be resilient over time and be able to survive. And this is what we it's called as the uh, Marsh Resilience to Sea Level Rise tool. And so that is the MARS metric there. And so what this metric does is it's a multi indice score. So it has the 10 different um, uh, categories and metrics that are uh, 10 metrics that are summarized into five different categories of resilience. So looking at long term rate of sea level rise, turbidity, sediment supply, vegetation, percent of marsh, below lean, mean high water, um, etc. And then within each of these metrics, it's given a score of one to five, indicating the level of resilience from low to high. And the, the scores are used to calculate the overall uh, resilience of each site. And so this basically results in, as you can see here, a stoplight diagram. Red is obviously poor, yellow is moderate and green is good. And so in terms of what we do with these scores is that with these scores, then you can start looking at if there's high resilience, what kind of actions can be done to secure, uh, as you'll see there, the example action is maintain ecological integrity, reduce plants, invasive species, pardon me. Moderate to low is looking at enhancement or major restoration. And the low is to look at, can we secure additional lands to allow for landward migration and remove barriers to landward migration based on the scores. And this is just another uh, diagram that kind of summarizes about different strategies about resist change, accept change, or direct the change. And that's similar to what is being said in the uh, that table there in terms of how we can use this tool to inform actions. So in terms of the, the data collection is these are just some examples of how we've, uh, you know, this is how the data gets collected through different installation of equipment and utilizing databases that are available like Natural Resources of Canada. There's a crustal velocity model that's updated to look at uh, 
you know, horizontal and vertical land movement to inform relative sea, le sea level rise. There's use of data loggers to look at tidal range, uh, monitoring buoy systems, and then uh, relative, uh, or what they call these um, surface elevation tables to look at their relative change in sediment accretion over time, both shallow and deep. And then there's uh, cores that are also done to look at historic rates of accretion. So, and here's just examples of what that looks like. Um, the monitoring buoy in the top left uh, with the turbidity logger, the surface elevation table with the, um, those pins that are dropping down, as you can see, and that just takes measurements of the elevation of the marsh platform. So one thing is that it sounds great to do all that, um, but in the coast of BC, there's um, we're obviously geographically challenged with um, you know, access and there's capacity limitations. So we really wanted to implement this tool um, throughout the coast of BC. And one way that we um, started to work through it was to look at partnerships with Indigenous communities and First Nations and First Nation groups. Uh, there's a lot of capacity and obviously knowledge of these sites and there's ongoing guardian and fisheries programs and land resource programs. And so we wanted to look at uh, partnering with um, several communities to help implement and to see if we could actually um, get this on off the ground and moving. And so for the last five years, we've been fairly successful in partnering with all these different nations and collecting water quality data, doing the measurements, uh, looking at uh, different vegetation communities, all feeding into this resilience tool. And just recently, we've been able to, oh, pardon me, sorry, this is, these are the locations of where we've been able to implement um, this monitoring tool. Uh, and so you can see from the southeast of Vancouver Island, from the Cowich in Nanaimo, all the way to the Needon in uh, Camdus in Haida Gwaii, and several spots in between. And so this is what it's looking like in terms of all the sites that we've been monitoring. We have 15 sites monitoring, and this is some of the data that's coming in. And as you can see, here's the stoplight diagram. I know it's um, very small print, but in terms of the resilience rank, you can see we've only have one site that ranks high. So it is going to be resilient over time to the relative sea level rise in the area. Two that are moderate high and the remainder are moderate to moderate low, which indicates that we need to start looking at um, enhancement, restoration, acquisition, um, large scale projects that will build in the resilient capacity of these systems to maintain the habitat for fish and wildlife, and as well as those important plant resources. And so what this looks like, how we take these scores from this metric to inform uh, restoration is, so here's an example I pulled out that shows the summary of the, the scores, basically that of all those different metrics. And so risk, as you see, risk is the overall resilience score and identifies estuaries that are at risk. And one represents lowest, five is the highest resilience. Average is just the average across the metrics. And this ratio shows what uh, marshes are not gaining elevation at rates with sea level rise, uh, relative sea level rise in the area. So for example, this site has a moderate to low resilience and indicates the estuary is at risk. And so I pulled out the example of that management actions table from earlier. So in the moderate to low category, what we look at is trying to identify projects that can enhance resilience or facilitate desired transformation. And so from an enhancement perspective, we'll look at projects that could be focused on removal of dikes, berms, restricting tidal influence, con enhancing connectivity to freshwater channels, um, to increase different sediment distribution patterns to help build those marsh elevation platforms and distribute the nutrients. And then the low is that we start looking at how can we, are there barriers that we can remove to help uh, facilitate landward migration? Um, do we secure additional lands? And then that final block there is critically important as well is that with limited resources, we want to make sure we're making the right investment at the right location that will actually help these systems be resilient. Because uh, in some cases, there may be investments that aren't going to help and it, it may not be, um, there may be other sites that are better use of those resources. So with those scores and that table in mind, we start looking towards how do we identify restoration enhancement projects to address the resilience score. 
And so what we did with that, with the scores, is we started to evaluate potential projects uh, using the different quantitative and qualitative measures and also relied upon a scientific and technical advisory committee that was helping us focus on uh, some of these uh, core questions. And so we started to uh, do an evaluation of processes restored, the ecological values, what's the certainty of success and resilience scores, does it address the underlying score to actually um, build in resilience to the ecosystem. And so what this looks like is it's just an example, another where we start to pull each category was standardized and we eliminated sums that weren't quantifiable. And then we started rank, we ranked them and gave them a scoring from the, uh, what was the most important to, you know, what could have the biggest value and biggest uh, change in the ecosystem versus the smaller ones. Not saying the smaller ones aren't important, but it was more us focusing on how can we restore the processes that build in the resilient capacity of these ecosystems. So what I'm going to do for the next few slides here is just give you some examples as after where what we've done. We've actually used these scores and our ranking process uh, and then using that uh, process that we've ranked restoration projects to actually implement um, uh, projects at quite a few of these sites. And so the first one here is in Nanaimo River Estuary. As you can see, the index scores are showing it's a moderate to low, and there's been some real challenges in the estuary. It's the largest one on Vancouver Island, and it's significantly important for fish, wildlife, uh, important for Nanaimo community uh, in terms of cultural significance. And so working through our rankings and teasing out some of the information from those metrics and then engagement with the uh, Nanaimo community, we started to identify that there was a challenge with um, freshwater distribution and sediment distribution in the estuary. And this was a result of um, a gra huge gravel bar that had started to form um, as a product of some in gravel or in river mining that had happened historically in the southwest corner that was pulling most of the water towards the city of Nanaimo side. Um, and it was not su supporting the majority of the estuary. And then we had sat down with the Nanaimo community and had information from elders and knowledge keepers just about the importance and the history of how the river used to flow and harvesting locations. And so uh, two years ago, we started to work, and as you can see, the before, uh, mid, and then after to actually redistribute some of the fresh water and to create a new channel, uh, the historic channel there, and to start pulling some of the water to distribute it across the greater portion of the estuary. Um, this project is now, uh, we're coming up, it's been 18 months since it's been completed. So there's been a lot of monitoring uh, uh, going on just to see are we having the desired uh, impacts in terms of the distribution of this habit, of, of this fresh water and uh, sediment and nutrients. And it was a partner project that involved a lot of people um, in terms of Stadimo Nation was on site helping every day. Uh, we were doing fish collection, DFO was on site. Um, as a partner, uh, we had partnered with a, a large uh, uh, company, Lafarge, to help out just with the gravel handling, and they did most of that work in kind. So overall, it's been a fairly successful project, and we're monitoring it. So hopefully we'll start seeing some of those adjustments in some of those scores that we actually are um, increasing the resilience of the ecosystem. The next example is from the Cusimer Salmon River uh, estuary, uh, northern Vancouver Island. Uh, or mid north mid at Vancouver Island, and this ranking came in at moderate. And so, similar process working with Comox uh, First Nation and through Nanmakola's Council as well, looking at opportunities in the Salmon River estuary to facilitate reconnection of habitats, reconnection of distributary channels. And we focused in on there was an old road that had been built to f historically for a float plane terminal and basically a, a dry dock for boat maintenance. And so working with uh, the First Nation and partners, we identified two locations where we should put breaches in that would actually help with the distribution of water, access to more habitat for fish and wildlife, and look at spreading some of the uh, freshwater flows throughout and hopefully building the marsh platform up um, over time. Similar um, project was done with the Guagulth Nation uh, at the Guatsi Estuary, that's North Vancouver Island by Port Hardy. As you can see, it's got a, um, its scores aren't, aren't very good in terms of the resilience. And this one was a challenging one because we also had to work around uh, infrastructure. As you can see in the photo there, there's a road that goes right through the estuary, but underneath that road is a, 
significant water main that feeds uh, commercial uh, uh, operations, uh, BC Ferries Terminal uh, and other community in the area. And it was very difficult. Ideally, we could just dig up the whole road, but we didn't have the uh, resources to move a water line. It would be about an, a six kilometer rerouting of a water line and it was going to be millions of dollars to do so. Working with the nation, we identified another location similar to what we did at uh, Salmon River was to put another breach in and you can see the before and after on those photos um, to redistribute the uh, fresh water and to hopefully build up the marsh platform, greater access to habitat. And it's been um, a really good project. So we've had the community engaged throughout in terms of um, helping inform restoration, the monitoring, uh, what plants to plant that are significant for the community. And this is an ongoing project that we're, um, there's another phase that'll be coming. Um, we've been able to one of the other things we've done with, with the resilient scores, we've actually been able to acquire another parcel of land uh, in that area to help facilitate some more restoration and landward migration. And then this is um, a significant project that at the Cowichan, and this is a moderate to low score. And this one is probably will be the largest estuary restoration project completed on Vancouver Island that I'm aware of. It's focused on the removal of three and a half kilometers of old dikes um, and restoration of about 150 acres of estuarine marsh habitat, distributary channels. Um, and this is a, a really focused project with Cowichan tribes in terms of restoration of fish and wildlife habitat, but also we're really incorporating uh, the food system revitalization component of this project and working with the community to identify uh, planting programs um, and looking at how we can help support the food systems and revitalization and re-engagement in the area with Cowichan. And, and so this is a, an ongoing project. We've done the first phase, which was a smaller phase at what we call the Cook Silo Marsh, which is in that middle picture. It's kind of the middle of the estuary there. There's an old farm uh, berms there that we've worked on. And then the big significant part of the project, um, you can see in the design map there is we'll be removing the the big diking system and start looking at, you know, how can we build in resilience? How do we incorporate food systems, uh, fish and wildlife habitat, uh, resilience scores? And so that's going to be, we've already started the implementation and that project will continue for the next couple of years as well. And finally, I just mentioned that the in Port Hardy um, about a recent acquisition, but this is one that we did uh, in the Fulmore Shoal Estuary, kind of central mainland coast. And this is one of our uh, areas that we've been monitoring in partnership with the Cloacy First Nation. And as you can see, the scores here are low and the ratio is very low, it's, it's, it's below zero. So it's really not um, doing that well. And so in this area, there's not a lot of opportunities that we saw for restoration, but where we saw an opportunity is that we worked with um, there was a couple of private landowners in the area. And so with the scoring, we were able to look at how can we facilitate um, landward migration and you know, potentially stop further, there's basically industrial logging activity in the area. So for the last couple of years, um, we've been able to secure 340 acres, I believe it is, so that's the yellow and red blocks in this estuary to secure it for in partnership with the nation to allow for this landward migration and ongoing continuation of this habitat. As the picture you can see, it's significant. It's in, uh, for grizzly bears, it's in the Great Bear Rainforest area, uh, very significant for shellfish and other culturally important uh, species. And so this was one of these actions that we looked at, how can we use our resources that are available um, to secure land to allow for this landward migration to happen. So key takeaways um, to this now is that this marsh resilience tool is, is scalable across a broad landscape. It's, it's really important for partners to be involved, obviously, with BC. Um, it's a very geographically diverse coast, um, and it it's often poses some challenges. Um, one thing with this marsh resilience to sea level rise tool is the uh, National Estuary Research Reserve uh, individuals who piloted it. It has also an open source data analysis platform. So they wanted to make it available for other user groups and to make it relatively easy to use. There are some nuances to it, but 
it's it didn't require us on the back end to do a lot of uh, detailed uh, programming for analysis of data. It's all open source, and they're actually very very approachable. We've had a couple of them on our scientific technical advisory committee, who's helped us through the process in terms of just some of the data um, and how, you know the analysis and interpretation of the results. One of the other challenges we found was that there's um, data is limited across coastal BC, especially in the remote communities. Unlike the National Estuary Research Reserve System in the states where they have uh, very good access, um, some of these sites have dozens of staff, millions of dollars of budget and real time data monitoring stations. Um, for us, we had to start looking at those creative ways to collect those data data like the turbidity loggers offshore and in river um, and then work through that uh, process. One of the other interesting things is with this tool, uh, we've basically with all the equipment we've installed, we're committed to these long term monitoring stations throughout the coast. Those 15 sites, as you saw, they're fully instrumented and we'll, we'll continue to collect the data with our First Nation partners moving forward and also have the funding to support our partners in doing that work. Um, the other Probably the most important thing here is that the community partnerships throughout um, the coast was critical to the success here. Um, that this would not have been able to happen without our, our First Nation partners at all. Um, and, and basically following through on those three bullets I put there are really <clears throat> important that, you know, all knowledge sources are respected and acknowledged. And there was, we had a lot of uh, um, input from the Coastal Guardians, people who have been there for centuries and millennia about equipment installation, locations, the seasonal changes, uh, the changes over time. And so that really helped this project be a success. And then when it comes to the restoration planning side of it, we, you know, we really wanted to have a shared decision making and make it more of a place based focus that rather than a top down decision from a Vancouver head office or whatnot to actually engage meaningfully in these communities to identify important projects and make sure that we were being fully transparent and working collaboratively on the implementation and ongoing monitoring of them going forward. And we created a lot of partnerships with other NGOs, academic institutions and um, federal provincial agencies. And this last bullet here is, 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 is important too, is that stable and consistent funding and ongoing resources for monitoring adaptive management is critical. As Jason identified at the introduction, we did receive a fairly large grant from the BC Salmon Restoration Innovation Fund, to which has helped and we've received additional funding. And But it's really important that there's stable and consistent funding to have these projects be impactful for a long time. And um, happy to announce that we've actually have five additional partners joining us on this um, monitoring program five additional nations. And so the number of sites, I think we're going to be up to just over 20 now throughout the coast. So, um, and with that, I think I'll end there. Um, there's some more information. There's a dedicated project website, and there's also a very detailed presentation that myself and Steve Henstra, our restoration biologist, um, did, uh, two years ago that went into the details of all the different types of equipment, the installation, how data is being collected. And so I put the link there as well. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Uh, well, thanks, Tom. And uh, just before we come to specific questions for Tom, just to give a heads up to our, our morning speakers, we're going to come to full panel in, in I don't know, somewhere in the five to 10 minute range. We'll just take a few questions that are specific for Tom, and then Tom will just kind of roll through with you and bring the other panel members back for, for questions uh, for the whole group. But uh, for me, I think I'll start with the first question that, that's floated to the top from our Slido. Uh, and are there situations where we might want to skip the Mars assessment and go straight to taking restoration action? So I'll offer you a chance to comment on that. Yeah, I, I think the, um... It's a very good question because, you know, when I mentioned about uh, engagement and local place-based uh, decision-making um, is, is that it's really important because there's a lot of people that we can all walk out on a site and see, yeah, hey, that, that shouldn't be there. That road is blocking uh, connections. And so, yeah, I think restoration uh, can occur, uh, obviously, with, with there's resources and capacity. I think the big component here is that... Um, we, I think we're all focused on, we want these systems to be resilient over time and uh, be adaptable and to make sure we're the habitat supply is still going to be there. So while restoration action should happen, absolutely. I just think there needs to be a, a fairly robust monitoring component of it that looks at, you know, what's the restorations um, 
uh, goals and what's intending to do, but then also to try and link it to those larger processes at play in terms of resilience of the ecosystems and estuaries. And, and then just to start looking at, um, is it contributing to that and how can we actually enhance some of these restoration projects that may be done? So I, I think there's, it's a combined effort. I don't, I don't necessarily think you have to wait for years and years and years of data to implement restoration. Cause a lot of us know there's um, restoration that should be done fairly quickly. And it's just more so looking at the monitoring and adaptive management moving forward. Great, thanks for that. I'll, I'll turn to Byron to, to do our next question. Yeah, great, thanks, Tom. Um, I, I, I guess I'll look towards the, the top of the Slido again and, and just maybe similarly give you a, a opportunity to comment on that. Uh, um, an interesting stat that you mentioned that a, a one acre of estuary provides more food than an acre of agricultural land. And um, can you, do you care to comment or can you provide some more comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so I, that's a, it's very interesting because one of the um, the things we've heard, and, and this has been, it's been a very interesting project overall, and it's been, you know, I've learned a lot. It's been a very steep learning curve is, is from our First Nation partners about you can't separate restoration and ecosystems from food systems. This is, you know, I've heard, learned this fairly closely with Cowich and tribes that, you know, one goes with the other. And so there's been a look at that in terms of, in terms of the productivity of an estuary, so looking at the importance of it from juvenile Dungeness crabs or crabs or salmon or uh, plant resources, is that over time, a one acre of a healthy estuary will produce more food than one acre of agricultural land. So whether or not that's corn being planted or carrots or or whatnot, but they just looking at the whole ecosystem uh, approach to food productivity and basically the whole food web and what that supports. So, um, you know, in terms of benthic invertebrates supporting salmon, which uh, then we have crabs and forage fish and migratory birds that are all supported. So it's a very fascinating uh, component of, of a lot of this work. And it's something we're trying to incorporate more moving forward is the food systems lens to um, our restoration actions. Right, back to me. Uh, I'll, I'll just stick with the, the Slido queue here. There's a lot of great questions loading in there. Um, can you comment on the permitting that is required for one of these restoration projects? What permits do you need and what was the process like? And, you know, I know something about the permitting. So if the list is really long, maybe uh, talk about the broad strokes, but if it's more definable, uh, you can be more specific. So I'll let you run with that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really good question. A lot of it is project specific. So for example, um, you know, looking at the Cowichan project. So there's a lot of things that go into a decision to remove um, what would they would consider a regulated dike structure. So under the Dike Maintenance Act, there's a process for permissions to remove um, or decommission a regulated dike. So we had to go through a really extensive process on that project in terms of assessing transfer of risk what's what's gonna the uh, potential consequences or transfer of consequences and then in addition to that we've got gone through a fairly uh, robust period of um, with archaeology work too because you know all these sites these estuaries have got huge historic values and cultural significance to a lot of our first nation partners so part of that process has been doing archaeological overview assessments engaging the community elders um, about the importance of place and locations and then working through uh, required any permitting through the Heritage Conservation Act in British Columbia. And so that that those are just two unique examples outside of the regular Fisheries Act or Water Sustainability Act notifications that a lot of these projects go through. But it, there's a lot of specifics to certain locations in terms of what triggers happen. And so um, a lot of the permitting is, um, it takes time, but the one thing that is really beneficial with the partnerships that we have with all the different communities and the engagement we have working with both the regulator and our funders is that by the time we get to the, the point of the permitting thing, a lot of it happens fairly quickly because everybody's been engaged since day one in, in, in an open, uh, transparent dialogue about the different steps of the way. And um, and so obviously permitting is not without its challenges, but um, we've um, seemed to have been able to overcome a lot of those hurdles moving forward. Awesome. I think um, it's so wonderful to see 
the, the positive uh, progress and the success of, of the work that you're doing. And uh, it's, it's inspiring in the context of, of some of the challenges that our ecosystems, our salmon habitats and our salmon populations are facing. So really appreciate this work. And I've had the opportunity to see the, at least a little bit of the Coxyla, uh, a tour and project uh, with Tom uh, a, a couple of months ago. And uh, it's, it's really powerful to, to be able to see that.